Hey, Gaming Geek here with a video on how to play Kill Team. We're going to go ahead and do a run through of the rule book. This game is relatively simple and so I don't think it's very complicated to get a hold of. But we're going to go ahead and work through the rule book and I'll show you examples here on the board with a part, uh, with the scenario that we draw. But before we do that, I want to just say to my Patreon supporters, thank you for supporting my channel. You guys have a chance to win one of these Table War Fat Mats for the August 2019 drawing. And so if you currently aren't a supporter and would like to get in on that, go ahead and click on the descriptions below to my Patreon page and you can get more information there. If it's past August of 2019, click there anyway and you can see what our current giveaway is going to be. But without further ado, let's go ahead and dive into the rules for Warcry. So here is my Warcry set, completely painted. Uh, it took me three weeks to paint everything, but I'm pretty happy with how everything turned out. And I also, for this tutorial, printed out this uh, dice holder, as well as this token holder, and there is link below if you want to print that out. I found it on Thingiverse. So we're going to go ahead and go through the rule book step by step. I'll show you the details of each page, but I won't be reading through it, but we'll be highlighting uh, each of the rules. So the rules actually start on page 32. Everything before that is background and fluff. And so go ahead and skip over 32 if you're just trying to figure out what the rules are. And so here it talks about three different ways that you can play. Uh, open play, narrative play, and matched play. Also, it describes a campaign section that's going on. And the core rules actually starts on page 33. It also describes um, D6s, how to roll D6s, and it shows all of the tokens that are available in the game. On the next page, we see an explanation of the fighter and ability card. So let's go ahead and take a look at the Untamed Beast ability card. And basically it shows that this is the faction symbol and these are uh, the symbols that denote which one of your characters can actually use these special abilities. So for example, when you take a look at these character cards, it shows you what symbols that they possess. And this one is a general fighter and can use basically any these two special abilities. Because it doesn't have these symbols at all, it can't use these four. So it can only use these two special abilities as well as the universal abilities that are available here, uh, except for this uh, triple over here. So you just look for, for example, um, you'll notice that this is one of the leaders, and so he has that symbol there, and he's able to use this um, all-out attack ability because that symbol corresponds with what's on his card. So just take a look at what is available for each of your units and the special rules or special abilities that come with them. Uh, also these unit cards um, explains uh, what faction that they are. This is their movement of five inches. This is their toughness of four. And then this is how many hit points they have. This is a unit's cost so that when you're putting together your army, that's supposed to go up to a thousand points. And then um, here going from left to right is the fighter's weapon, uh, the range, so this is a melee weapon so it's only just one inch away, the number of dice that you roll here for the attack characteristic, this is the strength characteristic of the weapon, and then this is how much damage you do, that with the first number being uh, a hit, and then the five is a critical hit which is when you roll sixes. And so that's the amount of damage that you do based off of your roll. Here are some general rules. Basically, you, uh, whenever you have a re-roll, you can only re-roll dice uh, once. After the first re-roll, you are not allowed to re-roll again. Roll-offs is basically uh, you and your opponent roll one die and whoever has the highest wins. Measuring distances is similar to most other games. So all you do is you take your ruler and you measure the distance from one base to the other. And so between these two is about two and a half inches, base to base. And when you do movement, you basically go from one edge to another. So for example here, uh, if this guy, this iron golem, 
uh, his he wanted to move three inches he would go from here up to here so front of the base to front of the base and that is three inches so visibility is basically can you see any part of the target model from any part of the attacking model and then you have visibility uh, you don't count the base and then there's a couple of other uh, rules here that will come into play uh, later on so let's go ahead and go to page 34 uh, this is how you set up the battle. So basically you pick your warband and there's some restrictions. You have to have at least three total in the warband and no more than 15. There can be only one leader in each warband. Then you start off with a priority roll where you just do a basic roll off. So you'd grab one die from the Iron Golems, another one from the Untamed Beasts, and the Iron Golems would win with a six. So they have priority, and then uh, since the Untamed Beast lost priority, uh, each player splits their warband into three groups. I'll take my band and split them up into the Dagger, Shield, and the Hammer group as a battle group. And the restrictions are each battle group must have at least one fighter and cannot have more than half the total fighters in the warband. In addition, at least a third of the fighters in the warband must be in the shield. Okay, so let's say I split up my Untamed Beast in these three categories, my Dagger, Shield, and Hammer. But right now this is illegal because in any one group, I can't have more than half in any single group. And I have nine total models, and right now I have five, which is more than half of the entire group. So I have to remove one of these guys and stick them into another group. Now, I can't stick it into my hammer because the requirement is that the shield group must have at least a third of the group. So they have to have at least three since I have nine total. And so one of the guys has to come over here. So this currently is a legal grouping of my dagger, my shield, I have three in there, and then my hammer. And here for my iron golems, I have these three in my dagger, these four in my shield and just one in my hammer which is legal because there are eight total so I have uh, no more than half in one group and I need at least a third in the shield and I have to have at least one in the other two categories. Next we're going to go ahead and create the battle plan, uh, draw the battle plan cards and this is composed of the terrain deployment victory and twist deck. So here I'm going to go ahead and draw first, and this is the uh, person who won the priority roll, so the Iron Golems will go ahead and draw a card from each deck. So let's go ahead and do that. This is first the terrain card, and so what we see here is um, a setup that is like this. Alright, so I went ahead and recreated uh, this scene here. And then next, we're going to draw the deployment card. And here it is a standoff. And so, let me see, that is the shield actually is going to deploy first. And so um, they will be within six inches. And then the hammer will be within this zone here. So this is a symmetrical deployment. And then at round two, the dagger will come out first. And so, see, I miscalculated because I put most of my guys in the dagger because I thought they were going to come out first. But apparently the shield and the hammer are coming out first instead. So that's where there's a variability in uh, needing to readjust your strategy because now I have on the iron golem side these five guys coming out. Also, the player that won priority will um, decide which side, whether they're going to be blue or red. So Iron Golems are going to go ahead and choose to be red. So they will deploy first and will traditionally start off with placing their dagger. Uh, but because they are going to come in round two, we move on to the shields next. He will deploy his shields first, which is within six inches of the edge and in the center. And so all these guys have to be, the shield have to be within um, three inches of the designated deployment zone. And so let's just stick all of these guys here. And 
I'm pretty sure that is within six, about six inches of the edge. Yep, that's right. So uh, they are set up there. We'll go ahead and move them here a little bit. So after he goes, then the other side, Untamed Beast, will go ahead and place their shields as well within six inches. Go ahead and just use this six inches which is here and they can actually be um, any um, height so as long as it's within three inches horizontally of the deployment zone they are good and so I'll go ahead and stick them here like this and then now we go ahead and deploy the hammer and so he only has one guy in the hammer area and this is back here so he'll go ahead and stick them here and then he has two guys for hammers untamed beasts and I will go ahead which um, they're allowed to deploy up here all right so they're gonna start up higher uh, than the iron golems next we go ahead and draw the victory card and this will tell us what the victory conditions are and this is the prize so the players roll off and the winner places one treasure token on the battlefield within six inches of the center and then battle ends after three battle rounds and the player whose fighter is carrying the treasure wins the battle so they go ahead and roll off once again to tie so you re-roll and um, the iron golems win again so they're going to go ahead and place a treasure token as long as it is within six inches um, and so clearly they're gonna they're gonna stick it here because it's within six inches of the center of the board and then finally you're gonna draw a twist card and so here, this is no respite. Fighters cannot use the respite ability this battle. And so this is a universal ability. So here we see it, you can use a triple, basically um, as long as they're not engaged and you remove a number of damage points allocated to the fighter equal to the value of this ability. So let's say I had um, triple a triple five like this at the beginning of my roll. I could have used this to heal one of my guys five points, uh, but uh, during this entire battle, uh, this is removed, and so no one can use that ability. So this is important for some of the objectives. You have to measure distances from the center of the marker or the token, not the edge. Also, it's considered controlling an objective if you have more of your fighters within three inches of the objective um, than the enemy does and so you gain control of it that way also pertinent to this scenario is um, carrying treasure if at any point uh, in a move action if a fighter moves within one inch of the treasure token he can uh, have the fighter pick up the treasure the fighter can only pick up one piece of treasure at a time and he can also use an action to drop the treasure if the fighter is taken down they automatically drop the treasure and they get to choose anywhere that is within one inch of the fighter to place a treasure token there. So now that setup is done, we're going to go ahead and go into the battle round. So, um, battle round has three distinct phases, the hero phase, reserve phase, and the combat phase. So in the hero phase, uh, both sides will grab six dice and um, roll all of them. So... Obviously each player is going to roll their own die, but because I'm the one playing all these guys, I'll go ahead and roll all 12 dice. So the Untamed Beast, so this is what you do. You sort out sort of all of the doubles, triples, and quads that you have, and any remaining singles. So let's go ahead and start with the Untamed Beast. Uh, we see that they got a double here, uh, and a double fours. So let's go ahead and use our handy dandy uh, dice holder. So Untamed Beast has, and then two singles, right? No repeating. And then here we see um, a double three and wow, 
they have six or four singles. So because um, the iron golems have four singles, uh, they have the initiative. So you count up the number of singles, whoever has the most will take the initiative. So starting with the one who won initiative, which is the iron golems, they will get a wild die. So each round you get a wild die that you can use with your roll. And um, you can choose to save it and not use it and that will carry over. So that next round you'll actually have two that you can opt to use. But um, let's go ahead and use this. And so he could use this to go ahead and add another uh, single die if you're trying to take the initiative from the other person. But he's not going to do that because he's winning initiative right now. So he's going to go ahead and use this to turn this um, double into a triple. So he'll move this over and he has one triple with a value of three to use during his turn for one of his abilities over here. And then the Untamed Beasts are going to choose to use this, also do the same, uh, and create a triple with the fours. So since none of them had a triple to turn into a quad, uh, they won't do that. So these die are basically wasted um, since it's only to determine initiative. Let's say that they are tied in the number of um, singles that they have. Okay, let's say it's two to two. At that point, you do a roll off to see who wins the initiative. The next phase after the hero phase is the reserve phase, and this is only rounds after the first. And so this is where, again, here in our deployment, we see at round two um, that they will deploy their daggers. But the first round, obviously, we're not going to do that. And then we move on to the combat phase where players take turns to activate fighters in their warband. So during the combat phase, each character has two actions that they can take in any combination of these, which is a move, attack, disengage, and wait. And so you can move twice if you choose to, uh, you can attack twice, uh, obviously I don't think you want to disengage or wait twice, but uh, we'll go through each one of these options. But um, one of the things that is also true that you can do is an ability. So each fighter can use one ability during its activation and that doesn't count as one of your actions. And so you can do it either before an action or in between your first and second action or after your second action. And so um, the abilities is basically uh, using these dice that you rolled to do any of these special actions. Again, these are universal actions and so I could use my double here and it doesn't matter what the numbers are for most of them. I just use any double that I rolled to be able to do this double rush, um, which adds one to the move characteristic. Uh, I add one to the attack characteristic uh, for that fighter. Uh, again, we can't uh, do triples, but normally you can heal based and this is where it does count what you rolled and so if I do a triple with the four that's how many I heal four points um, and then with a quad the fighter can make a bonus move and a bonus attack that doesn't count as your regular uh, limit of two actions and then each of the warbands has their own special and you have to keep track of which one of your fighters can use it based off of these symbols and so this triple harpoon snag can only be used by this first um, harpoon guy. I don't I remember their names and, and I wish I, they had their names, but um, the first fang, that's who it is. Um, he's the only one who can use a triple to do this harpoon snag. The pounce is only for the cat, right? So um, you just have to be mindful of which one of your fighters can use the abilities. The ones that aren't limited are these. So Unleash the Beast as well as Savage Fury can be done by any of the uh, fighters in the Untamed Beasts. So uh, having explained that, let's go ahead and move to move actions and see uh, what you can do with move. Okay, so there are four types of move actions. There's normal moves, jumping, climbing, and flying. So let's go ahead and look at normal moves for now. Uh, some limitations, the fighter cannot move through other fighters, including friendly fighters. Uh, so you have to move around. A fighter cannot move through any part of a terrain feature. We'll talk more about terrain later. No part of a fighter can ever move over the battlefield edge. So just the edge of the board, obviously. You can't go past that. So more about normal moves. One of the issues is if you start within one inch of an enemy. So let's go ahead and use my Untamed Beast here. 
he's within one inch of this drill master and so if he's going to do a normal move what rather than disengage um, he has to end up uh, at least equidistant or closer to the drill master so this is only if you start off uh, within one inch of an any model so theoretically he can move over here like so as long as again he's within the same uh, distance now he does come within an inch of this model as well and so that restriction will apply and so next turn if he moves if he does a normal move he has to be within the same distance or equidistant so in essence at this point he can't really move Next, let's talk about the jump move. And so you basically take a look at their movement value and they are basically able to jump as long as uh, it's within their total movement value. So let's say this guy here, the first fang, he can move up to five inches. And uh, let's see if he's able to uh, jump across, which uh, he won't be able to because um, five, is just shy of being able to hit that ledge. Now, he, if he wanted to double move, he could choose to do a move here, which gets him a little bit closer. And at that point, he would be able to move again to do five uh, inches of movement, and that could include a jump uh, all the way out here. Now, he can also choose to jump down onto the ground. And so the way that you do this is, let's say uh, he has a movement of five, so just do it horizontally out to here. And then at the end of the movement, he just falls down. Now, there is a rule with falling. If you fall three inches or more, you have to roll for damage. And what you do is you just take one die and you roll it. And here I got a six, which is really bad because if you roll a four or five, he takes one point of impact damage. And if you roll a six, he takes three points of impact damage. Uh, again, that's three inches or more. Also, characters can opt to climb, and climbing is done very simply. So as long as they can climb a feature, uh, you just measure the vertical. So it takes him two inches to get to the edge, and then another three inches uh, to move up the side of the building. So uh, he would be able to come over here and move up the building and finish his move on top. So climbing is relatively easy. Let's go ahead and uh, talk about terrain, even though that's later on in the rule book. But um, basically, you can ignore any of the vertical of uh, any terrain that is an inch or less. And so this obstacle here is not going to affect this first fang's movement at all. You can just measure the horizontal distance and not worry about any vertical. Now, this, though, on the other hand, is more than an inch tall, so you do have to take that to into consideration. And this is considered dangerous terrain. It's best to move around, but let's say you're trapped and he has to climb up and over. And here, because it's over an inch tall, you do have to measure the vertical distance, which is two inches, and then he would have to go over and down. But you don't really want to do that with vertical terrain because you take um, impact damage. So again, you got to roll this die, and if he climbed it, fortunately here he would receive no damage. Again, four or five would be one point of damage, six is three points of damage. Also, the other thing is if he jumps or falls and is within one inch of dangerous terrain, again, he has to take impact damage in addition to the impact damage for falling down three inches or greater. So he would have to roll twice. Also, you can move through archways just normally as long as you have movement and just have to consider going through the center of the archway. Even if the size of the base uh, doesn't fit, it can still squeeze through uh, with no penalty. Also, non-beasts can move through doorways. Uh, so this is a door. These grates are considered doors. And you just, for these guys, pretend they're not there. It doesn't require more action or more... Uh, inches to open a door as long as you have the movement to go through you can just go through freely two other things regarding terrain and one is let's say the first thing is attacking this planes runner and he rolls a critical hit he has to roll and see if he falls off or not as long as he's within a half inch of the edge 
of any unprotected uh, ledge. And so in this circumstance, he would roll a die. And if he rolls a one, which he just did, that means he falls. So two and above means he doesn't fall. If he rolls a one, he actually does fall. And in this case, uh, he would take not only impact damage, but because he's next to a deadly terrain, he would also roll another die uh, to take damage uh, based off of the spikes. The other thing to take into consideration is that um, any character who is three inches or above another character receives cover bonus, which is basically their toughness gains a plus one for this attack. So speaking of cover, um, this is one of the more controversial rules that is in this uh, rule set, which is way better than Kill Team, which had a ton of problems with how they wrote their rules. But uh, what it says here exactly is when an attack action targets an enemy fighter that is within half an inch of an obstacle, the target fighter of that attack action receives the benefit of cover if the fighter making the attack action is closer to the obstacle than they are to the target fighter. Now this is worded a little bit strangely, but Basically, the intention is, as long as this planes runner is within a half inch of this obstacle and the attacker is closer to the obstacle than it is to its target, which in this case, it's intervening, right? He gets a cover bonus. Again, that's a plus one to his toughness for this attack. Now, the reason why people are getting confused about this is because technically the same rules can apply here. So he's within half inch, right? Um, of this wall and theoretically he is closer let's say he's closer because he's actually touching the obstacle than um, he is to this guy in this circumstance technically he has cover now I don't think the rules meant for that to happen and so the way that I'm gonna play it is this doesn't count as cover even though uh, specifically with the rules uh, this actually does apply I think it has to be intervening terrain, because uh, that's sort of stupid, I think. Um, so as long as there's intervening terrain, this guy's receiving cover, this guy as well, and he, they would both get a plus one to their toughness for this attack. Okay, so now that I explained movement, um, it is the Iron Golem's turn, and so they're gonna activate first, and he's gonna choose to go ahead and activate the Signifer, who has a movement of four. And so, um, because he is starting off within one inch of the treasure, he's going to go ahead and pick up the treasure. So I'm going to move this over onto his card, signifying that he has it. And he's going to go ahead and move um, four inches. Now, here, here's a problem. Again, you cannot move your own friendly guys. And so I'm going to go ahead and move around this feature. And again, his movement is four, so he's going to go up two and then four, so he will end up basically on the other side of this barrier. Now that was his first activation. I'm gonna go ahead and activate again and do another move action um, for his second action. And he's going to end up um, over here, pretty close to this guy. So that finishes his activation, so I'll go ahead and grab an activation marker and stick it next to him. So now it is the other side's turn. So with the Untamed Beast, I am gonna go ahead and um, activate my first fang, which is four inches. And so he's gonna go ahead and, as I showed before, uh, he's gonna actually just go up two inches because he wants to be able to, uh, actually he can't clear it with his four inch movement. Now this is where I might want to use uh, one of my abilities. Rush is add one to the move characteristic of this fighter until the end of their activation. So I'm going to go ahead and spend my double to do that action and it adds one. Uh, so he will be able to then uh, run over and um, get across this gap. So for his first action he's going to move up two and stop because he can't move anymore. And then he will go ahead with the second action, a uh, jump across, and he will be right here. And so he also will be activated. Now one thing I wish I could have done with my first fang was is my harpoon snag. Uh, to use my triple here 
to do the harpoon snag since he, it has a range of eight. So he could have thrown his harpoon. Um, and what it does is it is a bonus attack action. So even though I move twice, uh, I can attack. Um, and it basically pulls the target towards me. And in this case, it would have been four inches towards me uh, with the attack. But because I already used double rush, I'm not allowed to use two abilities in one turn. And so I can only use one of my special abilities um, per fighter per turn. And I used the uh, rush, and so that disqualifies me for the harpoon attack. So now it will go over to the iron golems. I think none of those guys has an ability to attack up on the ledge because they have to be within an inch because all of them are melee. The drill master does have a three inch range with her bolus. Instead, um, I'm gonna go ahead and activate one of my iron legionnaires and they get to move four. So what I'll do is go ahead and um, have him climb up so that's three inches and it will put him right on the ledge here. Do another move and jump across uh, to engage him like this. And what that does is that prevents him next turn from uh, targeting my other guy over there. So he is activated as well. So everyone is moving. So he climbed up and then jumped across for a second action. Okay, so now over to the Untamed Beast. I am going to use my Beast Speaker, who has a movement of five. To, and she's got her bolas, which is a range four. And so uh, I'm gonna go ahead and have her move her for her first activation, for her first action, move five inches, which is plenty of space to get her within range over here. And what she will do is um, go ahead and attack him, which she needs a range of four. I wonder if he, she can all, She's gonna actually attack the armator. What I'm gonna do is do the Savage Fury ability. Because if you don't use these dice, um, they're wasted because they reset at the beginning of the next turn. So I'm gonna go ahead and use, even though this is a double, I don't have any doubles over here. So I'm gonna go ahead and use my triple, even though I'm sort of wasting the triple. Uh, you can downgrade, you can use a quad for a triple or a double uh, and so on and so forth. So I'll go ahead and spend my uh, triple for this Savage Fury, which adds one to the move, move characteristic and um, adds one to the attack characteristic. And so basically I, I want it for the additional attack characteristic. So her attack characteristic here is a four with her uh, whip and that becomes a five. And so that is versus the armature's defense of four. So because her um, strength is five against a lower toughness of four, she needs to roll only a three plus on her dice to wound. And so let's come back over here. Uh, she's gonna go ahead, because her toughness has been improved to five, it's one more. So basically how it works is here, strength versus toughness. If the strength is equal to toughness, you hit on a four plus. With a cr critical hits are always sixes. Um, here in this circumstance, her strength is one greater than toughness. So no matter what the difference is, as long as it's greater, uh, you will hit on a three plus. Now if the strength is lower than toughness, you need a five to hit. So let's go ahead and look over here and look at her attack. She rolls four dice here and she needs um, threes to hit. So let's go ahead and grab her attack die. She rolls four of them and she gets three successes but none of them were hits. And so when you look here, each success does one point of damage. Now, if this had been a six, that six would have done two points of damage and then um, three, four, four total. But this was, um, I don't remember what it was. I think it was another five. Um, 
this only does one, two, three points of damage. So that's how damage works. So we'll go ahead and stick um, uh, this die over here to mark their wounds and set it over here. Uh, three points of damage. Now the game is supposed to use uh, these uh, tokens and you set it down next to um, the card, but I always find uh, recording the damage next to the miniature is more helpful. So she uh, did both actions, she moved and then she attacked. And then now it is the Iron Golem's turn and the Armature actually is going to come in and attack. And so the Armature's movement is a three, so he's super slow and he has to be within one inch in order to do a strength four attack rolling four dice. So he will go ahead and move uh, three inches, which is enough to get him over here. That's within one inch. And he'll go ahead and attack. Again, he rolls four dice and his strength is four against her toughness four, so it's equal. So he needs to roll a four plus to hit. Oh, and totally whiffs. So he totally whiffed because he didn't get any force. And so his turn is over. Uh, the Plains Runner's movement is five, so let's see if he can actually engage. So he's gonna go ahead and his movement is a five, Plains Runner. And so let's see. So he's basically uh, gonna be able to jump off the ledge over here and land pretty close and actually will be able to land and attack uh, this guy. But he has to roll to take impact damage. And so let's see. Oh, he takes three points of damage. And Plant Runner only has eight total points uh, before they die. So uh, he got hammered by jumping off. But for a second action, he's gonna go ahead and attack. He rolls three dice. He is at strength three, which is one less than his toughness four. So he needs fives to hit because his strength is less than the toughness. He does one hit for one point of damage. So the um, armator takes one point. A lot of dice out here now. Activation marker. All right, um, actually it will be his turn next. He hasn't activated actually, uh, a legionary. And he is just going to come in. He does have to move to get within one inch, but he is gonna come in and basically wail on him. And his strength is also three uh, versus toughness three. So it's equal, so all he needs are force to hit, and he rolls three die. He gets a crit, and then these are fails, but the crit does three points of damage. And so that's three more, this brings it up to six. The Plains Runner only has two more points of hit points left. And this shows he activated. So let's go ahead and make sure that we got all of the rules for the attacks. Um, I think the only thing here is if there are any enemy fighters within one inch of the fighter, they have to pick that target. So in this circumstance here, um, because he's tangling him up, uh, this first fang can't choose to target one of these other guys or over here. He's really the target he wants to hit, but he has to choose the guy who is closest to him. And then some ranged weapons do have a minimum. Now, none of these guys do, but they will say something like um, two to four inches. So it has to be at least two inches away in order to do the ranged attack. And then these guys also have melee attack options here uh, as well. But um, they can choose to use their ranged attack with guys that are uh, in melee range, um, since there is no minimum range in either of these. 
So let me go ahead and describe to you the two other possible actions that you can take. The first one is the disengage action. So if a fighter is within one inch of an enemy fighter, they can make a disengage action to move away. They can move up to three inches in any direction, but they have to be more than an inch away from any enemy fighters. Um, and so this is different from a move action because normal move action, you have to end up being uh, as close or closer if you are with if you start off within an inch of an enemy. So you can't use a normal move action to move away once you're engaged within one inch. Now the other thing that's important is um, the disengage action is not considered a move action in any way. So any special abilities that pertain to move actions does not pertain to disengage actions. So let me go ahead and give you an example. Let's pretend it's the second round and that these characters are all now unactivated. Um, let's say the armature wants to disengage. And so there is no um, role or anything that he has to do, but as one action, he chooses to disengage and he moves up to three inches away. So it has to, he has to end up further away from the enemy than when he started. And so this would move him three inches in this direction. And then for his second activation, he can go ahead and choose to do his normal move. Now his normal move is three inches and so he will just end up over here. And so that will be his activation. Um, Alternatively, let's say they're here like this, she can also do a disengage action because, let's say for whatever reason, um, she wants to use her bolas uh, more than she wants her melee because she gets one additional attack die. Um, all the other stats are, are the same, but um, she'll roll one additional attack die using her um, range weapon, her whip, versus her knife. So she chooses to disengage for her first action and she'll move back three inches and then she'll use her ranged attack to hit him once. Now honestly, that's sort of a dumb move because it's better for her to make two attack actions with her knife by remaining in place, uh, but that's one of the options that you have. The final action option is to wait and so um, you can use wait in one of two ways, uh, and basically the first way is after you take an initial action, whether that's a move or an attack, you can basically choose for your second action to wait, which means you don't want to do another action. That has no other implications for the rest of the combat round. You're just basically saying, I'm choosing not to do my second action. But if you choose to wait as your first action, as part of your activation, then later on in the combat round, you can again activate that fighter. So let's say... Um, it's the top of the next round, and uh, the um, Iron Golems have initiative, and so uh, it's his turn, and he's, he's done all of his uh, other characters, and so he's the last one. And so he chooses instead to wait rather than doing anything else. So just flip over the activation token uh, over to the wait symbol. And what that means is um, he's opting to wait and see what he does, uh, before um, activating again. And so he'll go ahead and take his turn, he'll attack, and then he can, during his next turn uh, activation, choose to do something with him. Now, he only gets one action though. When you wait, um, when you activate him later in the combat round, he only gets one action. So he can choose at this point to disengage or to do one attack or what have you. So what will happen is um, one side will typically have more numbers of models on the board than the other. And so what happens is once the side that has less models is finished activating all of their models, then um, whatever remaining models will get their actions one after another. So in this case, the two prey takers who haven't gone, uh, one will activate first, maybe do a double move, and then the other one will also activate, maybe do a double move as well. So there might be an advantage to someone who has more remaining models because they'll be able to um, rush in and maybe pound someone. So just keep that in mind. So then after everyone has activated, it is time for round two. So we'll go, go ahead and stick that here. And you guys start the hero phase again by rolling all of your dice. And so uh, here, the untamed beasts, and then um, these guys as well. Uh, oops, I forgot. They're actually supposed to roll off to see who has initiative. Um, and so just remember that this was a five. And so the Untamed Beast won the initiative. 
And so they take the initiative token and um, then you proceed on for here. I went ahead, um, basically uh, we have two sets of doubles on both sides and they both have the same singles, same number of singles, two each. And so at this point, the untamed beasts could choose to use their wild die to add another single here and then grab, but then um, the iron golems might also choose to do that as well. And at this point they would have to roll off. Uh, but uh, let's say instead he wants to create a triple, uh, wants to take the initiative. So iron golems would take the initiative at this point. But um, next comes in the sequence, a, the reserve phase. So as we noted, uh, this is where you have the uh, dagger crew coming in. And so for these guys, it means that they are deployed here in this corner. And then for the iron golems, they are deployed over here. So now these guys are available to activate during this round. The only other rules we haven't gone through yet is on page 48 and 49, which pertains to chaotic beasts. And so basically there are scenarios where uh, these guys will be placed on the board and they'll harass or attack uh, your characters, but uh, there's an opportunity where you can take control of them and try to use them to attack the other side. But it is risky because if you roll a die to try to control them, on a three and six, you can activate uh, that chaotic beast as normal and, and do an attack. And you basically look at um, their attack abilities and they do have, uh, if you want to use some of your abilities dice, uh, you can do some of these abilities. But you go ahead and use their cards here uh, and it shows you what kind of uh, abilities they have in order to attack the enemy. But if you roll a one or two, the opponent immediately takes that animal or beast that you're trying to control and they can perform an action against you. And so it is risky and that counts as your turn. So um, you sort of lose a turn and you get attacked by the beast. Basically you are able to um, include one of the chaotic beasts into your normal army and so you treat them as one of your normal fighters and this is typically in a campaign battle that you'll be able to do this. Uh, the other thing that's really important about chaotic beasts is let's say a scenario has chaotic, chaotic beasts on the board and you're like man this is really iffy I don't really want to take the risk of uh, trying to control them but this rule is if there are any chaotic beasts in play that have not yet been activated that combat phase a player must pick one of those chaotic beasts to activate and cannot pass and so in essence um, every chaotic beast that's on the board will be activated every turn that is pretty much it with the basic rules um, on page 52 it uh, tells you more about open play and the rules about that um, and the rest of the rule book uh, talks about campaigns narrative play uh, campaigns really are super interesting and is specific to each faction and so i think that is really cool uh, so go ahead and read through the rest of the rule book on your own but i did cover um, pretty much the the basic rules and i definitely uh, think the simpler rules uh, in this game compared to kill team makes this more appealing for me at least i know some people want to crunch your rule set but for me I really like how simple this game is. So that's pretty much it for the rules for Warcry. And I really like this game a lot. I like that it's a lot simpler than Kill Team. Uh, if you want to hear some of my criticism of Kill Team, go ahead and click here and you can see that review video. But um, this game is almost like they took all of my critiques of that game and made Warcry instead and so I really really am liking this game a lot so much so that um, I went ahead and purchased Shattered Storm Vault that I'm excited about assembling and painting as well as two other factions the Corvus Cabal as well as the Unmade so um, these guys are really simple to paint I think I can paint these in uh, about five hours uh, for each army so I'm gonna go ahead and do that and also I'm excited about um, running the gloom spike gets the goblins and so i grabbed uh this night vault which actually gives you 
uh, the models that you need for only $25. Um, you don't have to get uh, the squig hoppers, but I went ahead and grabbed this box because I think these guys are hilarious. And I've always wanted to play the goblins. And so I'm excited about being able to run these guys in this scenario and in this game. And so, as well, uh, if you're wondering, you can go ahead and click on the descriptions below to print out uh, one of these handy battle gauges. Also, I want to mention that um, after I set up for this video, my daughter came and stuck her little Shopkins figure here, which I thought was hilarious. And so, uh, I put her in the video as Arch Archeon, uh, being the one who's overseeing and seeing everyone battle to choose who is worthy enough to enter into his army. So I thought that was pretty funny that she put her into this um, dark uh, battleground. So hopefully this video was helpful in letting you know how the game plays and uh, I'm excited to give you some comparison videos in the future. I want to compare this to Mantic's fantasy skirmish game as well as Kill Team too to have a more in-depth comparison if you're trying to decide between these two games. And so thank you so much for watching. Go ahead and subscribe and like the video. It helps me out a lot. And we will see you next time.